Good afternoon, everybody. How you doing? Um, I just come across, and it was done yesterday, and I didn't see it until, like, just now. <laughs> like, it's almost 2 o'clock here where I'm at, but, uh, uh, it's the prosecution discusses the next steps and uh looks like they're being interviewed by court tv and this was 21 hours ago and i hadn't looked at it yet i got it lined up i got the defenses lined up because they talked to him her too uh looked like that dude wasn't with her but uh it was just the uh, the defense uh lady i forgot her name and i apologize but uh Let's take a look and see what they have to say. All right, let's do this. It's not that long, so let's get through this. That's right, Matt. It is our privilege to have prosecutors who are in the Special Victims Unit here in Palm Beach County Courthouse, the State Attorney's Office, Brianna Coakley and Karen Black. Thank you all for speaking to me after what has been a really intense trial. Brianna, I just want your reaction first to this jury coming back in four and a half hours with this decision. We're very happy and thankful for the time and the attention that the jury took with this case. We're, we couldn't be more pleased with their verdict. Karen, so many people want to know about how the victim in this case is doing. In your closing, you talked about how the animals were able to move about freely and he wasn't in his home. I think that was just Damn. so touching to so many people. What can you tell us about how he's doing? Well, from the reaction of him being in court, obviously he's been doing well, but as far as any other details of where he is or what's going on with him, we don't feel comfortable at this time disclosing any of that. We were talking about just how difficult cases like this are. Talk about what made this case in particular challenging to prosecute. Well, I think that any case that involves a parent and a child is like inherently difficult. I think a lot of times cases get talked about in the media and it gets kind of get lost that this is a real child, this is his real life, and this really happened to him. And so it's certainly complex for any child to have to come in and testify against their parents. He knows that there are consequences for his parents, and that can be very difficult for a child to have to come in, especially when a case has gotten a lot of media scrutiny. Karen, can you talk about generally what that process is like when you all have children who are no longer in the home, but they also are witnesses for you all. There was a one point where the Ferreter daughters were there inside of the courtroom. How do you all manage that, manage that generally when you have so many victims that have so many varying connections to the case? So I think you have to start off with, you know, victim advocates and people in our office that really help us. They help us get in contact, you know, with the witnesses, um, with people that are close to them, a support system to make sure that, you know, this is what we're going to do, this is what the process, and they know every step of the way, you know, what's going to happen so there are no really surprises for them to be worried about. Do we know uh, who, where the children are? I mean, are they with another family member? Are they with social services? Because the mother is being charged too. And I know they said uh, when the when he was found uh, guilty, the defense said, "Well, he doesn't have custody of the children. Can he, you know, stay out of jail until sentencing?" And of course, the judge said no. But uh, I'm wondering, she can't be, have, be around the kids either. That's what I'm assuming. If anybody knows, please let me know. Brianna, re re reactive attachment disorder, not something that everyone knows about. But I imagine that with you all having been in the special victims unit for so long, that it's something that you see more often than not. Would I be accurate with that? No, it's actually incredibly rare. Um, and it happens in situations where there's very um, severe early childhood neglect. But it's it's known within the medical community, and I think both of the experts testified to this in trial, that it's, it's incredibly rare, even in cases of extreme abuse and neglect. Tracy Ferreter. Um, we saw her very emotional today inside of the courtroom, and many were surprised that she was able to be in the courtroom, but she's out on bond. Her case has not been set for trial yet. Are you all the prosecutors on that case as well? We are, yes. Her oh. case um, will get a trial date going forward, but because they were severed, we decided which defendant to go on first. That's going to be epic. We know what to expect from the prosecution now, don't we? I'm excited. I'm even more excited. Does she get a similar deal that her husband turned down now that we have finished his trial? 
There hasn't been a plea offer extended in um, this case. We were trying to see whether or not we were going to resolve Tim's case first, um, but I, I don't know at this point whether or not there's going to be one. That's something that the defense and I will discuss going forward. What happens next? She will take the deal. I'm making a prediction. If they give her a deal, she's going to take it because he got a deal, didn't take it. Now he's going to jail for a long time. In terms of Tim's case, we know his attorney was arguing for house arrest and the judge said she could put whatever motions on the table for it. What may happen between now and perhaps the next time you all have to see him in court? So we're not really sure just because the next time we go into court is November 16th, which would be sentencing date. So between now and then, she can go ahead and file a bond motion, which, you know, would address his release status. But until then, he will be in custody until sentencing. Can we talk about yeah. sentencing? What looks different in sentencing than what we've already seen during the guilt phase? Well, at this point, it's up to the judge. The state and the defense will both be able to present witnesses and make a recommendation. But the decision as to what sentence is imposed um, is within the judge's discretion. Now, at this point there's certain guidelines that he has to look at but it's up to the judge brianna you definitely kept your cool throughout this trial um which as i mentioned has some very intense facts but i think the only time i saw you flustered was when we learned that the jury had seen that video that you had tried and worked very hard to keep out what was going through your mind and how did you all come to the realization that it was even back there um, it the one of the court personnel alerted us and it was determined that it was just a mistake the amount of exhibits and the data in this case was voluminous and uh, a mistake was made and the judge instructed the jury on the question uh, on how to consider that and to disregard it and uh, obviously it didn't make a, a, a difference in their verdict uh, but does anything happen in that situation I know you all didn't choose to move for a mistrial did you consider that at all the state can't actually move for a mistrial um, because uh, there is a double jeopardy in in the United States and so once the trial is starting we can't stop it if we did um, or if we were to ask for a mistrial we would never be able to charge him again so we just have oh. to keep going even though something like that happened I love getting wow. that information from the people who would know the most uh, Karen anything else that you think people should know when they're watching a case like this because there was a lot of attention on this case when you hear the term box that really seemed to draw people in but what do they need to know about child abuse cases that you all deal with day in and day out I think a big part of it is just be open and be patient because in a lot of these cases you may see evidence you may not see evidence I know in this case there were hours and hours of videos it was very tedious it was just you know why are they showing me this why is it day after day but I think in this case we had to show how the victim lived his life for those days that he was inside there yeah I think that's a good point uh, in yeah. this case we had lots and lots of video but a lot of times these child abuse cases all we have is the word of the child and they come down to just uh, believing that a child can be credible about the things that happened to them in secret and so that wasn't an issue in this case but when we talk about child abuse cases about sexual assault of a child that is something that we have to deal with every single day Brianna and Karen, thank you so much for sharing all that. Congrats on getting justice so for much. the victim in this case. Matt, I'll send it back to you in the studio. And Brianna, I want to ask you a question that Matt uh, Johnson, our anchor there, asked about parents who may be dealing with a child who has RAD. Who should they reach out to? What should they do if they feel like they're faced with what the defense said Tim Ferriger was faced with? Absolutely medical professionals over and over again. It's one thing, uh, it's not something to take into your own hands. That, that's what should have been done um, over and over and over. Absolutely not, what happened in this case should not have occurred. And I actually asked the defense attorney that whether they had any counseling. Was there anyone who, even a friend, someone in their church, who mentioned that this might have been a good idea? But this seemed to be something that they didn't <laughs> share with anyone. Was that part was of the case against idea, them that they were them trying to hide this and knew that it was wrong? I mean, it's not necessarily part of the case or the, the evidence that we had to present to prove this case, but there was no indication that anyone told them to do this. No, or that they got any counsel from anyone on To it. do this, no. no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. Okay, so we're going to move right into the um, the defense is going to be interviewed, and let's let's get her reaction. I'm curious. That's right, uh, Matt. Thanks for introducing the defense attorney who was sitting here with me, Priya Murad, and your co-counsel. Oh my God, they're both in red. So Karamwood, who you both valiantly. Uh, just really put on a defense for your client. It was Thank a very you. difficult case, but 
walk me through right now, knowing that this jury has come back with this decision. What's just the reaction there at the defense table? I saw you hugging Tracy so tightly. It's always heartbreaking. I think people forget this about criminal court, particularly when they're watching true crime or even court TV. I mean, you go from having a person who is free on earth to being completely incarcerated. So for Tracy, she went from having a husband that she has seen every day for her life, absent when he's, you know, traveling for work, to someone who's sitting in a jail cell. And as a lawyer, as a defense lawyer, that happens, you know, in, in our profession as well. And so it's, it's always, it, it never gets easier. Yeah, he seemed to be more prepared for it than she was. Um, do you, was he prepared? I know you asked for him to be kept out on house arrest. He didn't even seem phased. I was watching his face when the verdict came down. He he just, he his face stayed the same the whole time. And pretty much hers did too. She's just like, like this concern thing, like, oh shit, I'm next. I don't know. I mean... He just had the same face the whole the whole time, and even when he was found guilty, it didn't didn't change. Was he thinking that could be a possibility, or knew that today could have been his last day being able to go home? I can't speak um, on his behalf. I can tell you that prior to any of my clients, anyone getting a verdict or doing a plea, we have a discussion about these are sort of the realm of options that could happen. So he was prepared in the sense that we told him best case and worst case. And I know right out, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, right outside of the courthouse when this was over, there was a press conference. A lot of us were asking you questions. So some of these are repeats of that, but I appreciate you joining us here live. But I do want to ask about this decision not to take the stand. Uh, do you regret that he didn't get to tell jurors his side of the story in light of the verdict? So, look, it is the government's job to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. This idea that people should take the stand or need to take the stand and tell their story um, is, is really distant from what the Constitution requires. And so we made a decision based on you know, our belief that at that time the evidence that the state presented was not sufficient. Um, the jury, of course, took that and, you know, g came with the verdict that they did. But, you know, after a guilty verdict, you go back and you think through everything, right? Your void. If he would have took that stand, the prosecution would have just annihilated him. Why did you do that? I mean, just think about all the evidence and how they would just hammer him. I mean, it would be. It would have been a sight to see, I, I'd say, though, but there's no way he could have took the stand. <laughs> he knows he's guilty. Come on. Dear, you're, you know, could I have done this or that um, d differently? But I do feel that we put on, you know, absent some of the rulings, the best case that we could on behalf of Tim and, you know, where we're going to be pursuing an appeal for him. A lot of people were wondering about the 24 months that was offered by the prosecution oh, yeah. at one point before this case and of course now that he's facing 40 years at sentencing in November uh, wondering if he should have taken the deal but you revealed something to me that people may not have known that was a condition of that 24 months so the plea deal that we were provided was two years followed by five years probation contingent on Tracy either taking a plea or Tim doing a proffer against Tracy. I had asked the prosecution what the plea for Tracy would be, and we never knew it. It was kind of, okay, if he's not interested, then you know we're not going to negotiate on Tracy's end. So the decision that we made based on that, I mean, I think it's a little misleading to say that there was a clear plea deal in this case. It was made very last minute and close to trial. And, you know, Tim wanted to tell through the, the trial his story as well. So that was a plea deal that we spoke about in great detail and that he rejected as he has a right to do. Was there a, a difference between them being severed and together when it comes to plea negotiations? Would that have impacted it at all? I don't believe it did in this case. I think it can in other cases, but it did not in this case. Let's talk about some of the things that the judge did not allow in in this case. I know you mentioned that there will be an appeal in this case and that you may be trying to keep your client out of jail pending that appeal. But what are some of the strongest things that you feel you'll be putting in that appellate motion? So we filed several motions in limine regarding the child's behavior prior to um, 
when he ran away on January 28th, 2022. We were cut off anything prior to the age of about 9 or 10. The court found that it was temporally irrelevant. Even after the state's expert, Wade Meyer, said, oh, there's nothing before the age of 10, we were not permitted to cross-examine on that despite asking. Uh, my expert, because, she, you know, just given the rules of evidence, was not able to specifically speak about it. So we were very limited in what we could offer as far as the prior record. We also wanted to admit to show no malicious intent that there were actually adults since the uh, removal that um, have had to take actions um, due to the fact that the behavior of the child was not improving. Um, again, it's, it's not my intention to disparage the child, but these are in written pleadings that we believe that it was essential for the jury to hear this because it's um, it shows that other how other grown-ups, right, how other adults are acting towards him, which goes to this idea of intent. Um, and it also, you know, th th there is a level of hypocrisy here from the state that you know this is we have taken a child from a situation into another situation that should be improving and better the state's expert testified that if you take a child with an attachment disorder and remove them from that situation you anticipate to see improvement we asked if we could then discuss what was previously not permitted in evidence and we were not allowed to do so and just to recap that because I did think that was do you think if they had more evidence of the child being a turd from four to ten if they couldn't go back that that far would it made any difference it probably wouldn't have because it would reinforce the idea that uh well if he was doing all that why weren't you seeking even more help why wait why if he's that young you didn't. You never had consistent therapy for him, and you, you already saw an underlining problem at such an early age. I I think it would. It's just going to make it worse. I don't know. Let me know if I'm wrong. It was an interesting argument inside the court. I was a little bit surprised. And if they get to put that evidence in with, with cause he is going to appeal this. You know he is. And then they're going to try to get that in. I think. Okay, bring it. I'd say bring it at the ruling that Dr. Myers said that, hey, if you take this child and, or someone who's suffering from RAD and they're in a better environment than they should improve, and you all wanted to show that he may not have improved in the way that was suggested, but that was denied. Many things were denied in this case. Uh, was that frustrating at, at a certain point? You had to deal with a barrage of objections over and over in this case. The state has a right to make any objection that they feel is in good faith. So I'm never going to knock an attorney for doing what they think is right. I think that um, as defense attorneys, you know, I've, I've been doing this for many years now. We know there's always an implicit bias against the accused and their lawyers, regardless of whether people wish to admit that or not. This idea that people come in thinking this person is presumed innocent, no one does that. And so I think that unfortunately we see that in our courtrooms as well. And I think any defense attorney watching this can say that that is something that routinely happens in our trials. So of course I find it frustrating, but I am sorry to say that I am used to it. Um, and you know, as defense attorneys, we do what we can to put on our case with what we're able to present. Uh, when it comes to sentencing, what's that going to look like from you all's end? Do you have people already that you're planning to call? And what do you think the judge will do? I don't know what the judge will do. Um, in the state of Florida, you have um, a guideline range, uh, not quite like we have in our f federal courts, but you know, there's a score at the bottom and then a max, and the court ha has sort of that range. But the court can also do what's called a downward departure, and so we will, of course, be making every argument that we can to get Tim the lowest possible sentence. And what is that range? It's from where to where? Last time I checked, it's about prior to the child neglect being um, filed, which was done right before trial. Uh, he scored 35 months at the bottom up to the 40 years. And so that's about where the judge has the range. But again, the motion for downward departure allows the judge to depart under that um, range at the bottom. Okay. Let's talk about that child neglect charge because we were researching this case and then kind of scrambling at the last moment realized, wait a minute, this is different than the indictment. 
do you know what prompted the child neglect charge to being added almost a year and a half after they filed the initial indictment and after the plea deal was turned down is that right it is after the plea deal was turned down um, I don't know look the state has the right to file what they want on the information they have the right to add additional charges um, I don't think it's appropriate necessarily to pile on because as you pile on more charges that possible sentence gets higher and higher right and so you're sort of leveraging against a person to try and you know make them take a plea deal or not go to trial and so as a defense attorney that's very frustrating because as you know I mean trials are dying because of trial taxes because of mandatory minimums because of guideline ranges that are really scaring people um, from fighting their cases as they have a right to do can you talk about this family at all? Uh, this is a case that has really torn them apart. We saw the Ferreter daughters in the courtroom for closings, just reminding us that it's not just RF that's at the center of this. There are other children who are right now no longer with their parents. Just uh, what can you say from the defense and defense attorney standpoint? I think this is an incredibly sad case because I think regardless of what the verdict had been, an entire family has been completely torn apart. Um, and regardless of what, you know, the state has presented and what the jury has found, they did love these kids. Um, and at this point, you know, they went from a family of four who's like going on, you know, trips and going to Sedona and, and doing things together to being completely, I mean, now Tracy's out of custody, Tim's in custody, the kids are, some of them are together and I, you know, can't really speak to that, but, you know, some of the kids are separated and it's like this entire process has completely destroyed this family and the purpose and I'm talking now about sort of more dependency cases but the purpose of our dependency system is family reunification and and I said this before and I'll say it again if we gave people resources um, there is you have no safety net for people with a child with a mental health issue and people don't know how to handle it particularly I think it's becoming you know uh, more and more mainstream hmm. but I think that in general there's a lot of bad uh, advice out there there's a lack of resources Sources, and you can't just walk into an inpatient facility. You have to get a referral. You have to go through this entire process. And so I think that um, it is a real failure of the system, the, a lot of systems that. These people had money. They had insurance. I don't think it would. they could have gone to their new family practitioner when they moved to Florida and got a referral to get him some help. They would have said, oh, yeah, sure, you know. And they whip out their insurance card. I I think for them, it it wouldn't have been hard at all. We are unfortunately here today, and I don't think that Tim Ferreter being in custody or going to prison solves any of that. Now, the prosecution, we spoke with them just a, a bit ago, and they said that parents need to seek professional medical help, that that's the one piece of advice that they can give. Uh, can you talk about what help the Ferreters did get in those six weeks and if there was any kind of I asked you this before any kind of advice they got not just professional but any layperson that may have said this was a good idea no I mean I think it's very clear that the way in which and this was part of the defense that this was handled was not correct no one um, offered this particular advice dr. Rappa did say there are practitioners you know and uh, paraprofessionals that have a more you know a strict militaristic view of treatment but she doesn't agree with that and I'm not a professional, but I agree with her. So, no, that's not the case. But this idea that they never sought the help is not true. Um, the help is not easy to get for anybody with a mental health issue, including children and including parents of children. And when they came to Florida, they went to a pediatrician. This barely came out in evidence because we were only able to get into it a little bit with Dr. Rappa per the rulings. But there was an effort to ask for a psychiatrist. I mean, I think anybody knows you don't get, I, I, I can't get a doctor's appointment for three months out for, for, for my basic needs. <laughs> so this idea that, you know, there's just appointments available is not true. When they came in, they sought a psychiatrist. There was actually an incident at the school and one of the teachers recommended them a psychiatrist and they were waiting. They came in right before Christmas. So they were still working on yeah. it. And Priya, we only have about 30 seconds okay. left. Anything that you want to say before we do have to send it back to our studio in Atlanta? And thank you again for talking to us. I just am devastated for Tim Ferreter, for Tracy, for the family, and um, we appreciate the jury for taking the time that they did. We wish that the verdict was different, um, and I wish that this family could be together. I don't think what happened today solves any problems. Attorney Priya Murray. Well, there you have it. 
that was the defense speaking out. I don't know. They were there for three years in Florida. Now, okay, so he goes. They they moved to Florida. And especially if he's playing sports, I know i got to take my kid at the beginning of the school year for his annual physical so they can fill out this paper so he can go play sports. Y'all probably know what I'm talking about. So if they did that, they'd ask their physician that's giving him the, the physical, hey, um, he needs some uh, counseling or something, you know, some kind of therapy, and they would refer him one. Now, whether it would take a couple of weeks for the referral to go through, that's possible. But over three years, we're just talking about the years that they were in Florida. So all this time passed. Okay, she said it might take a few months for her to get an appointment. But how long did they take for that? I don't know. I mean, there's holes everywhere. But he has a right to his defense. And um, I just thought this was a good little icing on the cake to finish off this trial, which we're not done yet. He's still got sentencing. There's probably going to be an appeal. And, of course, we're going to have her trial. Uh, so it's it's still going to go. And uh, I'm going to try to stay there and try to do a better job uh, keeping up. I mean, there was a lot of testimony I did miss in this trial, I'll admit. Um, I could only get what I could get. I was a little late to it. Uh, and then having to go over so much material for the for just what videos I did on this. But when this comes around for her, I'm going to try to be there day one, get the highlights day one uh, that morning when the trial starts and try to stay on top of things and be a little better informed because, we, you know, we know I can always be better informed. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me, and I hope everybody's enjoyed this uh, this coverage. I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but interesting right it's it's very interesting it's always interesting but anyway thank you guys have a great day and peace out